Okay. So we're going to be recording this session. We're only recording the um, presentation part of it. So when we get to the open session, the open discussion, then that will not be recorded. Uh, so that is all I have. And without further ado, let's get started. Our first presenter is going to be Heather Hall. And Heather is an eighth grade ELA and reading teacher. She teaches at North Central Local School, and she's going to share how she's been using cell phones to teach her students at a distance and also using them to deal with internet access limitations. So with that, Heather, you're on and you can go ahead and share your screen. All right, we'll have our fingers crossed here. Yes. Well, let me know when you see it. it I don't okay. think it's popped up yet. It's not popped up yet. Yeah, I'm not so sure. This is going to go. Do you want us to... Do you want us to bring up your slides? Can you see our, our screen? So if we're going through the slides, you can tell us when to go forward. Yeah, well, and I have my screens going, so I can just tell you I'll, I've got my mind to look off of. It should be fine. Okay, okay. let's just try. I apologize, okay. everyone. Technology is a wonderful thing when it works, right? Okay, let me uh, go ahead and get that. Just a moment. I'll tell you when it's all right. Is everybody seeing the screen that says cell phone distance learning applications? Yep, we can see it, Leslie. Perfect. Yep. All right. So again, my name is Heather Hall, and I'm teaching eighth grade ELA and reading. Uh, my background is in a combination of special ed and regular ed. I'm at North Central, which is in Williams County. We can't be more in the northwest corner than Williams County. Our school district is relatively small with just 600 students. And this is the first year that we have gone all the way down to kindergarten and K through 12 are using one-to-one -one devices, which are Windows 10 laptops. Uh, we are currently in face-to-face, -face, but we do have some students whose parents and them decided to do distance learning. So the distance learning we're providing is through Nova. We will be using, uh, or we are using Google Classroom and Zoom as our primary sources. Next slide, please. So it wasn't too long ago that I was simply I there we go. It. Thank you. <laughs> I like, was simply I collecting cell phones at the door. Uh, I can't have C. Okay. Sorry. Are we okay? I used to collect cell phones at the door uh, prior to COVID. And then of course the kids jumped on the bandwagon and had, you know, all those months to do and use their devices uh, exclusively through uh, our online device. We tried to rein it back in at the beginning of the year, but I'm now just embracing it. Uh, I've turned my kids into their, their problem solvers. I say, go out, find an app that'll work, come back, show me how to use it, and I'll teach the rest of the class how to use it as well. Uh, I feel that they need to be able to evaluate not only the reading material that I give them, but they have to be able to evaluate their cell phone usage and the apps that they use as well. So my hope is that they're not only using the technology, but they're actually learning how to evaluate that technology too. Next slide. So right away, there are some pitfalls that come into play when you decide to use cell phones in your classroom or as a, a distance learning device. And of course, the biggest one is cheating, which we could talk about 
for hours on end. Uh, but I wanted to bring up a few things that weren't as obvious to me or were, were not in the forefront of my mind. Uh, one of them is the equity issue. Cell phones are great if you have a cell phone, but not everybody has one. And those that do have them don't always have the money or the income to have the unlimited data that it's going to take if they start using their cell phone on a regular basis. Um, our older students with my junior high kids, I'm pretty lucky. Most of them have cell phones, but if you are coming in from a younger viewpoint, those students cell phones. So it might be their parents that are going to manipulate and use the cell phone for them. I always had in the back of my mind this thought that if we are using a combination of devices, we should be good to go. The more devices you have available, the better off you're going to be. And that is true to some degree. But even if you are doing things in conjunction with your Wi-Fi and using a cell phone, there are times when bandwidth or connectivity, especially in rural Ohio, is still a major issue. Also, compatibility. Uh, it never dawned on me that my um, Android cell phone, when I put an app on it, if as long as you can get that app for an Apple phone, it should be the same. It's not necessarily. Buttons are different. The way it loads dif is different. We have um, programs that we use at school that will only load from a school-enabled device. So the, the device that we send home is the only device they can launch those programs on. So even if they're using a cell phone, they might not be able to connect to the things you need them to connect to. Small screens are also an issue, especially for me as a language arts teacher. By the time they type in their five paragraph essay, they typically don't want to go back over that small screen, scroll through things and try and make corrections. So I'm constantly trying to find ways to compensate for those who are only using their cell phone as a way to connect. Next slide, please. My students are loving the fact that they get to use cell phones in my classroom. Um, they do still have opportunities to have it taken away if they're not being responsible. But for the most part, they have stepped up to that challenge. And we regularly use them, the students use them, for these four um, topics at least. We attend Zoom meetings. Right now we are face to face, but at least two to three times a week, my kids are getting on Zoom while we are sitting in the classroom. And we have also done some evening sessions so that we can make sure they can connect from home. And they're loving the fact that, you know, mom went to Walmart and they still need to get on their Zoom meeting. They can get on their cell phone and at least attend. They love the small camera. Um, let's face it, who likes to balance that laptop on their lap and the camera's looking straight up your nose. It's not a flattering thing by any means. And so these tech savvy kiddos can use that smaller angle of a camera to make them look, you know, TikTok ready. Uh, they also like to use a combination of devices at once. They multitask pretty seamlessly. And so they may use Zoom on their phone and then work on a program on their school device, or they may flip-flop that. If we need to use our phones to do some recording, they might get on Zoom on their device. They're fluid at doing and using those things. They use all kinds of tools, all kinds of apps. Uh, the ones that have come up most recently that they use the most, when I ask them what do they enjoy using, they say the most valuable for them is their scientific calculator for math class. Uh, my kiddos who are special needs have said that they enjoy using the voice text. So those of you who have kids who need scribes, we've been using voice to text for quite a few of those students. And it's actually a way that I'm using to get around the small screen issue of a cell phone. So they use their Google keyboard that has its own little microphone button that's easy to access. And they may just make sure that they have the right document open and they start talking and they put it in. And then later on, we go through the process of our um, 
editing and we use a bigger monitor when we have that chance to do it, where they're not as apt to be tired by the time they get done with that five paragraph essay, they're more likely to scroll back through. The apps that they picked up that they are enjoy using um, are Rocketbook, which really, I'm just starting to show them Rocketbook. Um, it was called to my attention by an educator over by Cleveland. And if you have a chance to Google it, Rocketbook might be a solution for your younger students. Uh, she's using it to collect writing samples and literally the app um, opens, once you open the app, it will automatically take a picture of something in front of it and automatically send it to a file, um, an email. You can put it to your Google Drive, wherever your OneDrive, wherever you want it to go, it automatically will send it. And so parents are liking it and younger children are liking it because it's a very easy app to use. We frequently do our group reviews over Kahoot, Quizlet Live, or quizzes. And I call this group my security blanket or my bridge because our district has been using these programs for multiple years. So the kids are familiar with those programs, they're comfortable with those programs, and they're willing to try things to get to use them. So sometimes I use them as a bribe. You know, let's try doing this app or doing it this way. And when we're finished, then we'll get on and we'll do a Kahoot. And they enjoy having that comfort of knowing eventually what we're gonna work on is something they enjoy and they know. They are using Google Classroom. Uh, I'm using it pretty much solely. Very little of my work is paper anymore. It's all up and on Google Classroom. I do have students who prefer paper. And so for those kiddos, when they are finished with their paper project, they take a picture and attach it right in Google Classroom, which makes it very easy for me to grade because it stays right with everyone else's work. They also enjoy the app on their phones because it sends them um, like instant alerts and notices when they have new assignments. And they have told me time and time again that they don't like going into the old people's email to look for assignments. And so this is kind of, they're used to, you know, getting notifications on their phone. It tells them they go in and I'm getting more work out of them than I have in the past. That flows right into being organized. As eighth graders, most of them are not very organized. I can say since we've gone to using Google Classroom and the and the app in particular, the kids are not, they're not losing any work, none at all. The issue is now we just need to get it done. So it's been nice to have that. Next slide, please. Teachers, of course, we've been using our cell phones, I'm sure, for quite a while, but there were some things that I didn't really think about using my phone for. Uh, one of them was a document camera. I have one in my classroom, use it constantly, and it wasn't until I was at home without it that I had to figure out a way to come up with my own document camera, and I used my cell phone and soup cans to create what I needed to get myself to a document camera. Um, and of course, you know, we're, I do the same thing the kids do. I like having that extra screen. I like being able to Google something and find the answer. So I'm using it, especially for technology issues. Um, our staff is using it to digitize as much information and stuff as they can. We have several scanners slash copiers throughout our building but there's still not enough for the number of teachers who are trying to scan. So many of us are using our cell phones to get our, our information up to the cloud. Um, what I have here is a list of just a few apps that will work to digitize. And the most important thing to, to note is that you really have to work to find what works not only for you, but for your phone. And that's where we were digitizing recipes for the family and consumer science teacher the other day, and I was doing it on my phone, and she thought that was so easy, she couldn't wait to get home and do it. When she got home, she couldn't get her phone to work. She texted me and called me, and we're like, I, I don't know what to tell you. That didn't look the same. She thought she had the wrong app. She was just in a tither, and I said, well, 
we'll work on it when you get to school. When she came back the next day, I became really crystal clear that the app that she had was the right app, but because it was on an Apple phone, it didn't work at all like it did on my Android. And so she has decided that Scannable works better for her on her Apple. And so you just got to play with it and be open to listening to others and, and <laughs> as we have all done, helping each other out, being that lifeline, trying, try this, try that kind of thing. Uh, cell phones for communication, <laughs> big, big one, right? That's what they're made for. But I never once thought about using it to communicate with parents. Um, we did have programs that we were using that you could communicate with parents, but I usually stuck to the old standard email. Uh, I now use Google Voice app, which gives a phone number that is not my personal number, but it works and feels like a personal number, which helps us communicate with both students and parents. We're also constantly uh, working together, especially in my co-teaching setting when we are on Zoom. My co-teacher and I are texting back and forth, mainly for confidentiality reasons, because we don't want to put information in a chat, and yet we need something that's pretty instantaneous. And for us, our email, when I'm at home, it doesn't always pop through, especially when I'm on a Zoom meeting. So by delegating that for my cell phone, it's, it's helped. Um, it's also been good for admin to keep them updated, to have them come in. I've had admin pop in. Uh, I text them, say, I have someone who's acting up in Zoom. Can you just make an appearance? And it's a wonderful way to keep them in touch as well. And then, of course, those essentials like grading and posting assignments, I'm getting really good, and I'm actually getting more comfortable with using my cell phone. It was something I thought I wouldn't want to do. But again, with Google Classroom, having um, rubrics and everything right there on my cell phone to be able to grade has become easier. We also have a staff member who her kids, and I'm sure this is a lot of people, her kids are in a different district than she is teaching in. And so our staff meetings were always an issue because she is in the morning trying to drop her kids off and in the evening trying to pick her kids up. And so we've started all of our staff meetings now are on Zoom so that we can have that connectivity. And if it runs over, you can hop in the car and still be listening and at least get the information you need for your Zoom meeting. Next slide. So ultimately, there's another really good way to connect, and that's uh, using your phone as a hotspot. And this kind of overlaps with some of the other um, information that you'll be getting today. But using your cell phone just as a cell phone is great, but I'm also finding that there are many benefits to showing both parents and students how to use their phone as a hotspot to connect. You still run into a lot of the same issues like needing the unlimited data. You will have um, companies that are kind of in competition. They'll tell you that, you know, you can use your phone as a hotspot and get five devices connected. And I'll say, yeah, right, except not in Northwest Ohio because we still don't have very good cell phone service. And so your phone and your service is only as good as your provider. And so, Knowing that and, and working with that can be a little bit of an issue. Those are kind of the pitfalls of the hotspot. But there are also some really good things that can happen by using the hotspot. It is a possible connection that will help when your Wi-Fi connection is not very strong. You're kind of dividing and conquering in the process. And so it can help lessen that load on your Wi-Fi and be a way that you can gain access especially for those school devices that we need to connect through the school device in order to get to the programs. They can use their hotspot, still using their phone, put it as a hotspot and connect their laptops. I have parents who have told me they use their hotspot to help control how they regulate where their student works they will literally turn their hot spot on and throw it in the middle of the kitchen table and have all the kids in the house come to the kitchen table to work because you need to be a little 
more closely um, in proximity to that cell phone, whereas their Wi-Fi blankets the whole house when they are ready for the kid to be on a Zoom meeting, maybe, and they need to be more isolated, they'll turn their Wi-Fi on and let the child go to their bedroom. But they feel it's a way that they can kind of regulate so that their kids aren't stuck in their rooms on their screens all day long. And then, of course, mobility is probably the best part of having a cell phone, that you will use it as a hotspot. Again, parents on the go, they can have their hotspot on in the car. Kids can connect their computers and their devices to that hotspot and get some work done. Or I have a parent who has a cell phone specifically designated to use as a hotspot at the babysitters so that when they drop their kids off, the sitter has Wi-Fi, but by the time her children use the Wi-Fi and, and take up what they need to, the parent wants to make sure that her kids can also get on, so she leaves that hotspot there for them to have connectivity. So those are the ins and the outs of how I've been using it. Surely there's lots of other ways, uh, and hopefully we'll get to talk about some of those a little bit later. I will open it up now for questions. And John. Hey, yeah, this is this is John. Heather, thank you. What so much great information on, on that PowerPoint. I guess my question would be if uh, if if you had to tell your students that they were going back to the old way of doing things, how would they react to that? Oh my goodness, they would go crazy. <laughs> you know, and it's not necessarily a good thing. I think the kids literally are addicted to their cell phones. That we're to that point. It's like a extra hand and extra uh, brain, if you will, even for them. So they don't know how to function without it. And I think that's this fall became very obvious to me when we tried to put them at the corner of our desk, rein that in and say, okay, you know, we can't put them back in the caddies because of germy reasons, but we can leave them on your desk or put them in your book bag. The kids were still on them. So it was still a constant battle. Now that we've embraced it and I've just said, okay, you can have them out. You can be working as long as you're working on something and you're using your cell phone as it's intended to be used in my class, we're good to go. They jump on and try stuff and they're daring and they go places and search for things that have opened up entire new discussions and different ways of doing things. Like it was their idea to get online and do our Zoom meetings inside our classroom before they had to leave. Um, we did presentations. Normally they do a, a book review where they have to stand in front of the class and give an oral presentation. I had a student who figured out how to set up our Zoom meeting so that they could Zoom in and do their book review from the hallway. And so I'm like, all right, we'll try it. They no love it. I appreciate that. And remember, folks, if everybody out there, if you have specific questions, do put them in the chat and I'll make sure that I ask our presenters. Leslie. Thanks, John. And thank you so much, Heather. That was so much information, useful information. Re really appreciate that. Next person who's going to talk with us is Shannon Williams. And Shannon is a music teacher for K-6 and general music. She teaches at Plains Elementary as part of Athens City Schools. And she is going to share strategies she is using for dealing with limited bandwidth. There is my screen showing. Yes. OK, awesome. Um, so I'm calling this slow speed teaching because the speeds are slow, but um, the energy's not. It gets really intense and feels fast paced. I think the slower the internet, the faster paced it feels because you're getting frustrated and overwhelmed. Um, but this is just how I've coped with slow internet speeds um, here at school. Um, a little background. Um, so I, I do teach music. I teach kindergarten through sixth grade music. Um, I have for almost 20 years, or no, more than 20 years now, um, in Athens City Schools. So we are definitely rural, and internet is an issue. Uh, it, when you get into the town of Athens, it gets better for people, I think. But um, I teach at the Plains Elementary, which is on the outside of town. So my students in particular really struggle with internet because they are further out away from um, the, the – <laughs> 
for lack of a better word, from the city of Athens. It's not much of a city um, compared to like big urban areas. Um, and then you'll also see here that I am working on um, a PhD in instructional technology at OU um, that I'm just about finished with. Hopefully the end of this year, I will have that all wrapped up. So I've done a lot of um, tinkering with technology on the side. Um, so let's dig in to all this stuff. Um, let's see. So um, I have four or five different tips, basic tips. And throughout this presentation, which um, my understanding is this will be shared with um, everybody later on. So what I've tried to do is include links that you can use later. So um, this can be a resource um, for anybody who wants to follow up on any of these tips later for how I've accomplished that. Um, some links to go to to help you with some of these settings. So um, I'm just going to give details on each one of these um, tricks Honestly, there is no one surefire thing. I haven't found anything that makes it easy, that that solves the problem of slow internet. I've just found ways to lessen the stress as I'm doing it. I think under these circumstances, that's I, the best we can hope for right now. If there was a solution, I think whoever figured it out would be really rich. So, um, so the first one is video resolution. Um, if you are sharing things with your students, just always, and these are more um, f oh, mind frames of mind. Um, yeah. Kind of keep this in the back of your mind as you're making things. So if you're loading content up for digital learning, you want to save all of your projects at the lowest possible resolution. And while that's counterintuitive to what the rest of the world wants to do, like when you load something up on YouTube, you want it to be high resolution. The lower resolution it is, the easier it is for students to download or to stream those um, those that media that you've put online. So, um, if you, especially if you're making videos with your phone these days, really check the resolution settings because iPhones, for example, can record at 4K. That's really high resolution. So you want to turn all of that off, or when you save it, downgrade the resolution. But if you're just Recording off the cuff and not thinking about it, you're probably putting some really um, high resolution material online. And then um, students can go in and adjust their playback settings. And so, as I was saying before, you can click on this link and it'll take you to a web page that can show you how that can be done. Um, and then, after you've made your videos, if you're recording, if you have the ability to do any editing, which not everybody does, um, but if you do have something like iMovie or any of those types of programs, in there, you can choose a web friendly setting and it'll even describe it sometimes as for web hosting or something like that. Um, always choose that when you're uploading stuff for your students at school. Then I've got a couple links down here of um, other places to get settings for your phone or Androids. I don't use an Android, so I can't speak to that in great detail. But um, and then you can even find an online converter um, that this web page has a lot of good converter little tools that I've used several times. Um, and you can upload a video that you've already done and downgrade it that way. Another thing that you can do is now I, I will qualify this or put a little disclaimer on. I haven't actually had the opportunity to do this. I think it's a brilliant idea, but we haven't done it in our district yet. And because I'm a music teacher, I don't really, um, I'm not in a position to be able to suggest it for everyone in the school. I think this would have to be a building level thing, but um, it seems like a great idea. So I wanted to be sure to share it, but you could load things up on flash drives and send a flash drive home, like perhaps once a week that's loaded up with materials and then students wouldn't need internet at all. And they would be able to still use the Chromebook or um, digital tools to complete their work. So they're not going to be left behind other students who are working digitally um, instead, they would have, they could still do all the digital work. They just wouldn't need the internet. So you, in that case, you would put like PDFs and JPEGs and you could make graphic organizers and readings, um, audio recordings, so much stuff that you can put on a Chromebook that doesn't need the internet if it's preloaded on a flash drive. I do think if you did it, this is my brainstorming about it, that um, you'd want to have some sort of system in place and keep things organized for students so you could have you know a folder system similar to what you might have on an LMS or something so that they can learn where to find materials um, within that flash drive. So it's not going to work quite the same like hyperlinks and that sort of thing wouldn't work quite the same that they do when you're on the internet. But you know with a, a sheet that says you know go to this folder and get this 
um, item and read it and then respond to it. You can work offline on a Chromebook um, by their settings for that so that they could still do um, Google Docs, Google Slides. A lot of the different um, Google products can be edited offline and then they can be saved. Um, or there might be a case where they can pop in for one day a week when they come to pick up their um, their flash drive, then they could upload some things to the internet. Um, but I think that's a that could be a really creative workaround for students that um, if your district is kind of going the long haul for the whole year and you want to get those kids doing digital work, I would definitely check that out. Um, when you're doing, now I use Zoom at school, so that's the thing I have the most um, understanding for of. Like for example, right now in meetings, I, I don't really know, I didn't see very many settings at all. So depending on which um, platform you're using for your online meetings, um, you can go in and adjust some of your video settings to help it run smoother. So one thing I've noticed with some students is that they'll get online and they, we were talking about it before, when Heather was mentioning that some students are multitasking and they're using more than one device at a time, that's bad when they're on Zoom. If they have limited bandwidth at home already and they're, I've seen students sitting there trying to surf on their phone while Zooming, that's not gonna work very well. So um, I try to get them to turn all of the extra devices off if I see them using anything, close down as many tabs as possible and try and lower the impact on their, um, their speed, their service as much as possible. The less they have running, the better it will be. So to that end, if they turn off their camera, it makes a huge difference. That's a quick fix right there. A lot of people really want those cameras on and, and I, I get it, but at the same time for students with limited bandwidth, that is a huge drain on their ability to communicate with you. So if they can have their, and I, a lot of times what I'll tell students is, everybody keep your camera on unless your internet's slow and you can hear their choppy voices and that sort of thing. And those kids turn their, their cameras off and then they're able to talk to me. The audio works a lot better. So you could at least have an audio connection. Um, some students we have who will send their questions through chat and keep their cameras off. And you know, you just check in with them periodically and ask them to answer pointed questions, mention their name and ask for responses. And you can still keep the lines of communication open. Um, stopping your screen share, turning your camera off can also improve speed so that they aren't trying to stream video as well. Um, I think mostly, like I said earlier, it's a mindset. So just keeping all these things in mind um, and being um, thoughtful of them can help improve your situation. And then um, another big strategy that we use here a lot is to let students leave the meeting to go do their work. I did that today. We use um, a web page or a platform called Quaver Music, and it's super high um, bandwidth usage. I mean, it's it wears my computer out by the end of the day. My computer's dead from running it. Um, so today I told them, here's your assignment. Here's what I want you to do. Now leave and go do it. And I'll stay here on Zoom. And if you have any questions, then just pop back into the Zoom meeting and I'll help you out. But asking them to do online work and Zoom at the same time with slow internet is too much of an ask for their setup. Um, and then I've got a couple links here for some other Zoom internet tips if you need to read it or go a little further. All right. Preload your teaching materials. Um, this is kind of like a flipped classroom idea. And the more of it that you have loaded online, the more the student has the ability to access the materials when they can access them. So sometimes families are sharing a hotspot and the bandwidth can't support three students working on things at the same time. So if your content is preloaded, maybe a student could then access that material later in the evening or at off hours so that they can spread their bandwidth use out throughout the day or throughout the week. So the more you can have loaded ahead of time can accommodate those students. Um, so instead you would be using meetings for review instead of de content delivery if you're trying to be mindful of the, the drain on a student's um, bandwidth. Um, that one's, um, these are, I'm sorry, I guess I missed a, editing out a couple about buying milk. I'm not sure. <laughs> we even proofed this and several, I say we, my husband and I proofed it several times. So um, I'll catch that edit here in just a second. <laughs> um, and then this is the last, I think this is the last one. This to me is kind of going out on a limb, but I didn't want to leave it unsaid that there's a lot of hardware issues. So for students who aren't completely dependent on what the school has to offer and they can 
invest in hardware and you have families who are asking for advice or tips, um, I personally did a big upgrade before the beginning of the school year um, for my husband is a professor at OU. So he was going to be streaming. My daughter is in her first year of college. So she's streaming and I'm streaming. Well, was streaming at home. Now we're here at school. We had we were really pushing the limits of our existing setup. So we called Spectrum and we upgraded our speed from 100 megabytes per minute or whatever it was to 400. Um, we went and got new Cat 6 um, grade Ethernet cables that we ran throughout the house. We put in two routers, um, one in the basement to service that area and then one upstairs. Um, and then surprisingly, we found out one of the other things that was getting in the way was my dongle that I plugged my Ethernet cable into to go into my laptop was um, limited to only one gigabyte um, data, GB. Yeah, I guess they're gigabytes, same GB and whatever. Um, so I upgraded that. Or no, I said, yeah, I'm sorry, device that will run at one gigabyte because the other one, and I don't remember the number, was slower. So you want one gigabyte. Um, that was, And I put links to all of the products that I bought. It's the best advice I can give. Not to say they're the end-all be-all, but these are the three things that I did for myself this summer. Maybe you'll want to consider it too. And it made a night and day difference. Um, our Wi-Fi um, signal throughout the house is so much better. It is so fast. It's faster than what I have here at school. So if a family has the option or you have the option and you're streaming from home or whatever your circumstances are, these are some hardware investments that you can make. It's an investment. It's, it's an expense. Um, but some people are have the ability to do that. Some people want to do it. So I didn't want to leave it unmentioned because I know that for me personally, we did it and it it was worth every penny. And, you know, watching Netflix is better too. So that's always a bonus. Um, and then this is the final one because when all else fails, do something else. So, um, you know, you can get creative. So the phone usage that Heather was talking about is big that some students might be able to send you things. So maybe they can't do the Chromebook assignment or the more elaborate one, but they could send you a picture of their written work. They could do a small video that could be texted um, and they could kind of function more like you know, um, their non-academic activities with the devices that they have and trying to think creatively for workarounds for just an ability to communicate with students in some way that they could show you their work that isn't dependent on having reliable um, internet at home because it just, it isn't always the case for everybody. And then um, I've even done a couple phone calls where the internet just wasn't working. So I just dialed in old school on um, heck, it could have even been a landline. I'm not sure. It was probably a cell phone, but I called them and I talked to them about what they were working on instead of trying to Zoom them. Um, and I had more luck with that. Plus, um, I think with some families that are um, like if grandparents are helping out, um, it comforted them a lot to just talk about it on the phone. So that's like a side benefit to it. But there are lots of ways to communicate with students. So if we're, the ultimate goal is for them to share what they know, I think there's a lot of workarounds we can do. And it's just being mindful of that um, is kind of the main, my main point. And that concludes my slide presentation um, and I can open it up for questions. So I'll and, stop sharing. Sure, and, and thanks Shannon. We don't have any specific questions, but what a fantastic uh, presentation. And to remind everybody, we will be putting a link to the presentation so you'll be able to go in there and use Shannon's, link, Shannon's links and find the things you're looking for. Uh, very quickly, uh, Joe Mancini did put a link in the chat talking about uh, the Ohio Remote edX Connectivity Champions which is a no cost service funded by Broadband Ohio grant. So, you know, if you if you're having those kind of issues, please take advantage of that link. With that, Leslie. Thank you. And thank you, Shannon, for all of those tips. And we will remove the milk comment from the slides that we've <laughs> <laughs> Um Well, so next up we were going to hear from Nick Conroy. And Nick teaches astronomy, physics, and physical science at Nelsonville York High School. And Nick is going to talk about that situation. I know a lot of people are ch being challenged with of teaching students in front of you in the classroom live, and at the same time trying to teach students remotely online. So with that, Nick, take it away. Hi, hopefully you can all hear me. We can hear you. Awesome. Hi, I'm Nick Conroy. Uh, 
as uh, I was introduced, I teach physics and physical sciences and astronomies at Nelson Villar High School. Uh, it's about 20 minutes north of Athens, so right down the street from Miss Shannon. Um, and at the beginning of the year, uh, our district came up with a kind of a hybrid plan of everything under the sun in case something happened. Um, so we came up with three plans. Plan C was everyone's online. We'll teach, you know, everyone online like we did in the spring. Uh, plan B was we'll do a cohort system where we'll have students um, split up into cohorts based on their last names or family needs. Uh, and then they'll come in for two days and then they'll have three days of um, digital online uh, education. And then the cohorts would flip uh, so you'd have two days with one group of kids and then would have three days off. And then the days that those kids were here, the other cohort was doing their digital days uh, and we just flip flop. Um, and then we also offered at the same time uh, the option that the students wanted to opt fully into an online um, asynchronous learning environment they could um, that is also provided by us, the teachers. So a lot going on there. Uh, and then plan A uh, is Essentially, those cohorts come together. Uh, we have all the students in class that we can. Uh, we have four in-person days, and we have one digital day that is on Monday um, to help us, the teachers, kind of balance uh, the students that are online, the students that are in class. Uh, it just kind of gives us a day to follow up and to um, make sure that we're meeting the needs of everyone. And again, at that same time, we're having that asynchronous online option. So. Our plan was to do everything, <laughs> so uh, it was kind of daunting. And so our solution to the chaos was essentially um, plan for online instruction because that way, regardless of the plan, uh, it would work. So if kids were in front of me, I can say, hey, open up the notes and I can do my lectures live in front of you guys. If we're online, I can say, hey, open up the notes and watch this video of me doing it. Uh, or I could do both where it's just like, if you're here, I can teach in front of you. Or if you're at home, you can watch this video of me teaching in front of other kids. Uh, so our solution was plan for online instruction. Uh, and then it also allowed us to, again, adapt to the student needs. Um, and it allowed us to take resources and kind of focus them in on supporting our students in that online environment. Um, so we went to a one-to-one -one ratio with our students with Chromebooks. So every student got a Chromebook uh, with a charger. Um, we did a survey of our students' uh, families' needs. If they needed internet, we are lucky enough that we have a local cable company um, that worked out a deal with um, the district and the parents to provide internet for that family. Um, so we were lucky in that case. Um, and then, yeah, so everyone's question is, well, that sounds like a lot of chaos. What does that look like? How are you managing all of that? Um, and so uh, essentially, we as teachers at the high school sat down and we wanted to make sure that we were being consistent across grades uh, as much as we can and across the high school. So our first step was to pick a uniform centralized hub where we will put everything and will be the go-to jumping off point so that if a parent calls science or a parent calls you know, social studies, we can all tell them, hey, go to this place and all the information is there. Um, so some options that everyone knows probably at this point, Google Classroom is ended, was what we ended up choosing. Um, some other ones that I've seen other schools choose is things like Discord, Canvas, and Blackboard. Um, and essentially, we as teachers decided, hey, we're not going to have them jumping around from this website to that website. Let's just have one centralized hub for everyone to get that consistency. And then once we get that consistency, um, we needed to get organized. We wanted to be, again, cross-categorical, cross-grade, cross the high school itself. We wanted to make sure that um, students knew where to go to find their assignments. It didn't matter if it was science, math, uh, English. Uh, essentially, we as teachers decided, all right, how are we going to organize um, this Google Classroom? What's it going to look like? And I can kind of jump out of here, and hopefully you guys can see 
my screen still, and you can kind of see my classroom. So essentially what we did was um, we decided that the stream would be essentially um, announcements only. Don't put any of your, one thing that we found in the spring was uh, the, the students' streams were just filling up with assignments. Um, so there's a setting that you can open up that essentially you can make it so only announcements pop up here. And so to your best ability, you should be doing a daily uh, kind of blurb of what they need to be doing in school, out of school. Uh, and then classwork itself needed to be organized into categories, which if you guys didn't know, you can do. Uh, you can create topics. Uh, and we chose to do a weekly basis. So essentially, uh, have the dates. And then if you can, tell them what day. So if we go down here, it's like, what did we do on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so on. Um, and so what they see here in science is what they're going to see in English social studies. So they know, okay, hey, these are the days of the school. This is what I'm doing on Thursday. And it was essentially clear for everyone across the board. Um, so that was our two main, um, our two main ways that we as a school decided to kind of tackle that hybrid synchronous, asynchronous, um, in class, out of class kind of thing was uh, plan for the digital, use, uh, use classroom. Uh, and then outside of that, we wanted to then, uh, it was then up to the teacher then to figure out how are you going to, you know, get your material across to the students. And so uh, my problem solving skills to this, uh, some tips that I learned along the way was I wanted to A, limit myself to how many new digital learning resources out there. One of the things that we learned in um, the spring was everyone was just trying to shotgun across the board and use every new fangled technology out there uh, and try to do it. And it's like, okay, let's pick a handful and get really good at those handful. Um, and uh, we wanted to make sure that what we did choose played nice with what we were already doing. So that's again why we chose to use things like Screencastify for screen sharing um, or to do our recordings on our um, Chromebooks because uh, it plays well with Google, Edpuzzle, quizzes, all those things play well with Google and Google Classroom. Um, so those are the ones that we recommended to the teachers to use. Uh, and then think about what you were doing before and try to figure out a way that you could digitize that. Um, to a point where it was repeatable and sustainable uh, for the year if it needed to be. So, for example, um, before COVID, uh, in my science class, we had interactive science notebooks. Uh, we would do things like um, worksheets, uh, labs. We would do, um, I would do lectures over slides. They would take notes, and then we would have a practice worksheet over it, uh, and then we might have a lab. So I kind of broke it. Uh, down my process into kind of the pieces uh, and tried to fill in that gap digitally with something that I knew that we could use and use easily. So for example, notes, uh, I could use Google Sheets to make uh, fillable notes. So uh, guided notes, and um, I'll go over that here in a little, in a second. Uh, my lectures, I had to teach in person and I had to teach kids online. So why work twice? Um, we have some teachers here. I'll do some pre-recorded stuff um, and then I'll post it. But some teachers are like, I don't have time to do pre-recorded. Uh, and so our solution was, hey, you know, you're teaching the kids in person. Put your Chromebook up on a table in front of you, in front of the board of whatever you're doing so you can make sure you can clearly see it. Hit screen, castify, and record yourself doing whatever lecture or whatever notes that you'd normally do on the board and then post that video. Um, so again, just kind of using those um, tech resources and filling in that niche. Uh, same thing with practice activities and digital worksheets. Um, for me, uh, again, I fell on to um, Google Sheets to kind of make fillable worksheets. Um, and uh, if I'm doing labs, uh, there's a lot of great resources out there for digital labs. So like for instance, right now we're doing a density lab. Um, so there's a lot of resources and simulations and FETs out there um, that allow students to have that same lab experience at home as they could in the classroom. And then the kids in the classroom were doing our normal, you know, safe distance um, density lab that we have done before. 
Um, so just again, trying to fill in those gaps. Uh, and then formative assessments and assessments themselves, things like Google Forms, quizzes, Edpuzzle, uh, all were helpful tools in it. So again, just tried to break down my process uh, and to use, uh, find a digital key that would essentially allow me to do what I was normally doing and not have to work hard. Um, so again, I'm gonna flip over here. Uh, a cool tool that um, a lot helped out a lot of teachers was how do you make essentially a fillable worksheet. Um, a lot of you guys were talking about earlier um, of how to essentially make PDFs and to scan things and get things onto, onto online. Um, once you do that, you can essentially uh, take a screen cap or you can um, snip out and you can make it the background on a Google slide. And so right here we see a worksheet that I have that essentially I've made the background the actual worksheet so the kids can't click on it or change it. And then wherever we had a fill in the blank, I just put a text box that they can type in uh, and boom, we have a digital worksheet. And so on Classroom, I can essentially assign this and say make a copy for each student. And now every student has a copy of the worksheet. They can complete online, send it back to me. If they're in class in front of me, I can say, hey, get out your Chromebooks, uh, do the worksheet, you know, uh, and send it in. If you're at home, make sure you get this done um, and send it in. Uh, notes are kind of the same way. Uh, I'll post, let's see here. Uh, I'll post, uh, do, sorry. Uh, I'll post things like um, uh, my lecture notes. So again, they'll have their slides that they can fill in. Uh, I'll have a video of me teaching it and I'll actually have the, the slides themselves all kind of there for the kids at home so they can watch me kind of teaching through it. Uh, they have a copy of them if they need it, and they have that fillable guided notes that, again, is just essentially I made, I took a picture of the worksheet, and I made it the background of a slide, and they can just fill into it. Um, and so that kind of took care of that uh, notes and practice uh, and lectures for me. Uh, and then I just kind of sprinkled everything on top. So that was kind of my solution to the issue. Um, so yeah, um, as I was going through, um, and I was, again, in the summer, we we're trying to figure this all out. A really great resource, I can't uh, say nice enough things. Uh, it's a YouTube channel called New Ed Tech Classroom. Uh, a gentleman by the name Sam Carey does it, and he has a thousand tutorials over any digital classroom tool that you can use. Um, he has trainings, uh, again, a great resource that essentially taught me everything that I know how to do uh, today. Um, so yeah, that's essentially, um, I think, all the time that I have. So I will open it up for uh, questions. Nick, thank you. Sorry, so I'm trying to <laughs> go through it. It's OK. Nick, thank you so much for all that information. We've had so much information today, and I want that we need another session for all this information. Um, I want to make sure we save time for Lori, and then I also want to share a link at the, a couple links at the end. So Lori, um, why, why don't we go directly to Lori since we're almost out of time? Um, if, if you want to go up, uh, Lori um, is going to talk about public libraries and the supports they're providing for low tech uh, low tech and mixed mixed tech solutions and Lori is a district library media specialist at East Holmes local schools and she's also an engage an education engagement consultant at WOUB public media so Lori take it away uh, I think you can see my screen I did add a bitly right at the top so um, we can put that in the chat it's a little, a little shorter than trying to do URL um, because we are short on time as a librarian, I always think of how can a library support us and um, reach out to help teachers. So first of all, I would encourage you to reach out to your own school librarian. They will be the expert in knowing what your public libraries in your region are doing um, as well. Are you hearing me OK? Yes. OK, I got a low, low Internet warning, so I was maybe, concerned. Um, <laughs> OK, off your video, Lori, and then that will be helpful. OK. Uh, what, there we go. OK, we'll give that a try. OK, 
So, um, so yeah, reach out to your um, school librarian and find out how they can support you in the classroom. I know me personally, I've hopped on the collaborative Zoom calls, promoted and shared lesson resources with teachers, especially this spring when we were scrambling for all the online. We are fortunate to be all in school, um, but when we were off school, many of our students do not have internet at all. Um, so we were dealing with doing packets. So that's where I felt like learning what the public libraries have. If you have kids in the inner city areas or um, children by choice, like our Amish population that don't have internet, we needed to come up with innovative ways to do no tech. Um, and that's a great piece to to queue into your libraries. So um, a lot of libraries are doing creative, engaging programming. You might explore those resources. They're collaborating um, and providing food banks for um, their children in their area. A lot of drive through opportunities or drop boxes so children can get kind of grab and go lesson plans. They can get grab and go library resources so they have reading pieces in their hands, um, as well as working with your own school librarian of how you can get books out to your kids um, when they are completely at home. Um, moving on, a lot of libraries are offering tech solutions. Uh, for example, um, several in the area are providing hotspots. So if you have a child that does not have internet at home, you might explore getting a hotspot through your public library to, to do that loan. And there is a new partnership grant that I have embedded a link on the presentation um, for the Appalachia areas. And I've listed the counties that are in that. They are providing hotspots um, for, through a grant opportunity. Um, many libraries are providing extended Wi-Fi and they're so um, students can at least go to that safe space and, and use the internet in a parking lot space. E-cards, definitely check out your public library e-card. Um, when students are able to get online, they can download e-books, e-audiobooks, e-videos and whatnot that they can then take home and they won't need internet to be able to use those resources. Um, Libraries are offering Zoom story hours. My local library offers a story line and you can actually call in on the phone and hear a story read. So that might be an opportunity for those younger children. Lots of creative programming is happening across our state. Um, and then just continue to reach out to your school library, your local library, just to see what they have. And then I did include just a couple beyond the public library resources. And I, I do wanna stop because I know we're about out of time. Thank you so much, Lori. And we are, I appreciate all of that information. We all appreciate all that information about how the public libraries can help out and a lot of good information there and on your handout. Um, we are at the end. I want to, uh, Roger Minier also had provided information um, about ways to locate um, Wi Fi hotspots. And we have just pasted that in the link. So please take a look at that. We just pasted that link in the chat. So um, please take a look at that. And also, we are going to be um, uh, put, uh, pasting in the link to all of the meetup slides. Uh, that you have seen all compiled. Um, I am sorry that we ran out of time for the um, open discussion. If people would like to have another meetup where it's just an open discussion about these types of issues, please put that in the chat so that we know that would be something you all would be interested in. Um, I, I want to thank you all for attending and I also want a big, a big thanks to the presenters who spend a lot of time when they have so much on their plate to share information with us all such useful information and also to the ed techs ohio ed techs for being such great partners and to all of you who are i know working so hard and doing so much for all of um, all of our students so thanks to everyone and also if you would like to get um to earn a uh, attendance a certificate for attendance we also have a link that we're pasting in for a Google form. And so you can um, submit that and you will be emailed a certificate of attendance. And also for future meetups, we also have the OLIS resource page there so that you can look and see what's coming. Um, anything else? Did I forget anything? OK. Um, all right, thanks. Thanks, everybody. And uh, thank you so much for coming and thanks to all of our presenters again.